So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, David Puppel from New York University. So I was having dinner with Tecumseh Fitch last night, and, he, and, and apparently our sli the slides are gone. Oh, what did you do? Uh, and he bet me. Don't, don't touch. Don't touch. Uh, he bet me that he would know what my first slide would be. So I have to oblige him. I would, all right, so um, Tecumseh, do you want to come and do my first slide? <laughs> I'll, I'll happily do it for you. Let's see if we actually get to a slide here. All right, close enough. All right, Tecumseh, do you want to do this one or do you want me to do this? I think you're an expert. I'm an expert. <laughs> so uh, this connects to the morning talks. Um, so we just heard about physics, the physics of sound and speech. Now comes a little bit about brain and speech. Uh, but I thought since it's, uh, there are a lot of linguists here, maybe we start with a caveat about why we do this sort of work and can we do this sort of work at all, as a matter of fact. So, you know, I, I work on language in the brain. Where's the pointer? You gave me a pointer, Marie. I have to switch it on. What a complicated device is that? Is it your, yours, Pierre? It's not your pointer? Okay, well, it's working. Okay, so let me get start with an example of language, but it's an example of language that I rather like. And I think you should like it too, and I'll read it for you. Anyone who seriously approaches the study of linguistic behavior, whether linguist, psychologist, or philosopher, or neuroscientist, must quickly become aware of the enormous difficulty of stating a problem which will define the area of his investigation, and which will not be either completely trivial or hopelessly beyond the range of present day understanding and technique. It's a nice example of language, and it's from um, Chomsky's review of Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior. It's still true. It's a good quote, and it's actually right on the money. So that's a good example of language, and this is an example of the brain. <laughs> uh, for the, this is the left hemisphere for <laughs> linguists. And um, so you might ask yourself, why bother? It's actually not so obvious. Wh what could we learn? And uh, I conclude that there are three possible outcomes. Um, so we could learn something about how language works by doing neurobiology. What do you think the chances are? I mean, I think they're low at the moment. I think it's very unlikely that we're going to learn something foundational about how language works from looking at neuroscience, regrettably, for my career. Uh, however, we could learn something about how the brain works, as we can use language as an assay to try to sort of interrogate properties of, of computation in the brain. But what's most likely to happen is that we're going to learn nothing. As this is going to be an example of interdisciplinary cross-sterilization. <laughs> and I, <laughs> just for you. <laughs> and I think, and I, you know, this is, uh, I think this is sort of true, right? So we come to these, you know, wonderful interdisciplinary meetings, and we obviously are here because we believe that there's something to be learned. But it's not so clear, actually. It's not so obvious what, uh, how to do that. Now, if I believe that completely, I should stop right now and we can get to drinks. But I'm going to try to argue that there, is, there are a few things to be learned. So you'll have to bear with me for a while. So why, wha what's the nature of the problem? Let me illustrate the, this a bit more for a moment. The, so the problem, just descriptively, is that when we talk about these things as linguists or as uh, neurobiologists, we use very different alphabets or vocabularies or ontologies. So for instance, if I ask you, well, what's the parts list of the mind? As a, if you're a linguist, you might say, well, look, I believe in something like you know, a distinctive feature, or I believe in something like determiner phrase, or small clause, or something like that. So there's, you have an inventory of primitives they use to account for the phenomena that are uh, in the scope of linguistic inquiry. And so maybe you have, you know, I don't know, merge came up a few times today, or linearization, or you know, some operation. So they're primitive representations, they're pr some primitive operations. And when we uh, when we go to the Society for Neuroscience, or we ask you know, 44,000 neuroscientists what they think is the parts list of that, they're going to say maybe a dendrite, or maybe a cortical column, or maybe an operation like long-term potentiation. You know, those are you know, well-known things in neurobiology. Uh, not very controversial. And the question is, uh, so what? And we have absolutely no way of knowing how to map these onto each other. 
right? We had some vague correlations. And so I think actually Stan mentioned this morning, uh, Randy Gallisfeld's challenge, that as cognitive scientists, we actually owe to neuroscientists the explicit challenge that you actually have to come up, or we have to come up with the circuitry or the architecture that can uh, form the basis for the kind of things we think, in fact, successfully explain features of language. But that means a reorganization not of the cognitive scientists, but of the neuroscientists, if you believe Randy on this point. So I think it's pretty interesting. But look, uh, we can debate to what extent there are some interesting correlations, but, you know, but uh, I'd like to, ha you know, if you have any answer, you should tell me, because I'm, I, don't th I don't think you uh, uh, okay, so which, which the, the, uh, I'll take, I'll, I'll bite. Which levels should we take? I mean, I'm going to go down that path in a second, so. Okay, well, so let's, let's move on. I mean, let's, let me, uh, we'll go on. I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to try to do that, but I think that's not going to work. We'll, we'll see, but that's, a, I, I think this is a good point for discussion in either now or later, whether this level mixing works. Okay, so. Just very briefly, what is the, uh, what's the diagnosis? What's the problem? Is that we don't actually have linking hypotheses between these domains of research. Uh, level or, you know, level schmebel. We don't have any substantive <laughs> linking hypotheses. And so why don't we have them? One's a practical problem. As what I, with Dave Embick, I called the granularity mismatch problem. As, as linguists, you look at s uh, certain phenomena with a, you know, with a very fine lens and very subtle, you make subtle fine-grained distinctions. Whereas as neurobiologists, we look at very broad and unhelpful categories. More dangerously is what we call the ontological incommensurability problem. Uh, I learned my morphology from, from Susan. You have to use long, complicated <laughs> words, and you have to use ontological and commensurable. <laughs> I learned that in grad school. So that's a little bit more insidious, because that could be not a practical issue. As we, could, we could begin to talk to each other inter in an interdisciplinary fashion in a substantive way by, by trying to cash out what are levels of representation w with which we can develop links. But maybe there are none. This is the Gal let's call it the Gallisfeld problem. That is, maybe there is, the way we're stating the nature of the research, no successful link to be had. Uh, I obviously don't have an answer for this. If I did, I'd be you know, rich and famous. But I think we have to bear that in mind in the context of interdisciplinary research, because it's just um, a difficult problem. Modulo what we're about, you know, your answer to it later. So what do we have? Well, we obviously have a lot of correlational information. As we know a lot, we can say, well, there's a brain. We had, you know, Stan gave an excellent talk this morning about, well, here's, here are a series of brain areas that can be linked systematically to particular kinds of operations. And you know, I have a horse in that race, too. So we can say, well, if you believe in some cortical organization for speech, it has a bunch of pathways. And there is a whole bunch of areas involved, some of them you recognize from this morning. There's stuff in the anterior temporal lobe and the superior temporal sulcus. If you, I'll pick some linguist for questions in a second. Uh, there's the temporal parietal junction. There's uh, which has uh, each can be attributed to each can be attributed some kind of computational subroutine. Uh, you can do the same exercise for aspects of uh, aspects of meaning. So that's all very nice and good, and you'll recognize some of these areas from from Stan's presentation. But obviously, the what we attribute to them is completely correlational. That is, we don't actually have an explanatory uh, stance about what, it, what is actually being computed, what is the notion of specialization, what are the representations being carried in these. So for instance, let's, let's pick one area about which there's some convergence, some aspect of the posterior temporal lobe called the middle temporal gyrus, MTG. And that's, a, that's a really important area of the brain. Monkeys, as far as we know, don't have this. Well, what's the parts list for that? I mean, we know across many studies uh, and many different approaches that it plays a central role in, let's say, compressing conceptual information into a kind of code that can make contact with language be put together and so on. So there's some kind of uh, lexical representational format. How do you do that? I mean, how, what's supposed to happen? I have no idea, but that's the kind of question we're going to have to answer eventually. So let me zoom in on one particular small and, you know, <coughs> problem where I think we can make a, you know, a tiny bit of progress, uh, a really tiny bit of progress, which is how do we even get to a form of representation that can make contact with this stuff? Let's say you know, we have stuff stored in our head, but it comes in in some other format. How do we even get there to get started to put words together? And so this will be my the sort of experimental portion of what I'm going to say. And it has to do with a very simple problem conceptually, which is how do you 
uh, I'm speaking to you, you're getting mechanical vibrations in your ear. They have to be transformed and make contact with stuff in your head, with column borders, right? So you have to go from vibrations in the ear to abstractions in the head. And we all took at some point some course in you know, psycholinguistics or acoustic phonetics, and this is a spectrogram, so there's time and there's frequency. And we learned things like, you know, Mark just said, well, there's voice onset time, and there's form and structure, and there's some interesting uh, internal structure. And then we say, ah, great. We're going to study this because we, you know, we go to Haskins Labs or we work in Ken Stevens' lab. And then we suddenly magically get cat on this side, which is the linguistic representation of some item. Completely different, highly abstract, making reference to, say, articulatory features or articulatory primitives. And so that's, that's what we learned from linguistics on the right side. This is what we learned from physics. And lest you think I'm some kind of you know, humorless formalist, you obviously know things like, you know, there's a cat that you know something about. So um, that's where that, that's sort of the you know let's say ninety percent of the work on this kind of thing. Now it turns out, and, and and lots of interesting progress is made, right? So people try to figure out how do you how does the auditory system, how does the brain decompose this sort of information to make contact with that kind of information? Now in the last ten years or so, there's been a lot of interesting research on a very different form of the data. Namely, when it actually hits your ear, it looks a little bit like this. So this is actually just the time-varying waveform of the sentence, cats and crocodiles don't play together. Right? So cats and crocodiles don't play together. This is cat. This is a kitty. Every talk has to have a kitty picture or a baby picture. Uh, now, it turns out that this information here, this temporal information, or the, you can see this outline here that's called the envelope of the sentence, turns out to be crucial for intelligibility of any kind. So if you play with that part of the stimulus, if you destroy it, people can't understand anything anymore. Right? So there's something very fundamental about the temporal structure of the input such that you can decode it. If you don't leave that, if you can't parse the information into the right kind of unit in the time domain, there can be no decoding and then therefore no contact with the abstract internal representation. So the kind of models that have been developed in the last few years um, involve a particular form of brain activity, neuronal oscillations. So as the assumption is there is internal brain activity sort of breathing along. So the brain is going, you know, it's vibrating, it has a certain rhythm. And it turns out that there's an interaction between the input, which is on top, the speech waveform, and the activity it elicits as it comes up the, you know, the afferent pathways, which is a property of an input system, and how it uses that to create chunked, uh, discrete information. So the question is, how do you go from continuous input to discrete representation? And you can look at, this is a more neurophysiological uh, approach. I'll come back to this in the end. If you like a more uh, computational, phenomenological model, Oded Gitza has a very nice uh, uh, instantiation of this. So what has to happen is you have to take this input information, you have to parse it into units of the right temporal granularity, and those are the units that you then decode to, make con to then basically take guesses at what you're looking at. So how did we end up with, the, with these kind of uh, uh, neurophysiologically inspired or neuro neurophysiological models? We stick people in the machines we know and love, and we try to, you know, we sort of cook them, and then we try to see what is the parts list that comes out, or what is the... So let me give you just a couple of brief examples of these kind of experiments. The, um, so those of you who don't do neurophysiological research every day, Here's what this kind of data look like. So we take a person, we stick the person in this kind of oven. Here's the MRI image, or the structural MRI. And then while, we're, while they're in this oven, we record their brain activity. So this weather map on the outside is actually the electromagnetic activity on the outside of the head while they're, let's say, listening to sentences or doing whatever experimental psychological task. You can then get these nice maps on the outside of the head that you can analyze quantitatively, or you can look at the real electrophysiological activity. Now we're really looking at activity millisecond by millisecond, right? So this is every time step of the process. So this is an example from Magneto and several other views. So what do these experiments look like that lead us to believe that we have these, these kind of models? Well, here's a quick example. Uh, here's an extremely simple experiment, probably a bad experiment. So you're lying in the machine. And I'm just playing you a bunch of sentences, sentence one, sentence two, and sentence three. And what I want to know, this is actually inspired from the neurophysiological literature, 
satisfy a, a, a single unit animal approach. So I want to know, can I identify a feature in the brain data that allows me to decode which sentence you heard? So not a very hard, you know, not an interesting cognitive psychological question. So you're just hearing a bunch of different things, and I want to know, can I identify something that leads me to believe you heard this, this, or this? So how did we do this experiment? It's very simple. You hear a bunch of different sentences uh, a bunch of times, let's say 20 times, and the presupposition of this kind of analysis is, look, if there's something in the data that's consistent across a sentence, uh, if you line up all your sentences, the same token over and over, there should be something that's coherent across repeated presentations of the same token compared to some mixed control set, right? So there should be something coherent across all of these, these, and these. That could be, so what could the, that coherence be? Well, it could be coherence in phase, for instance, so the detailed timing of the response. It could be coherence in power and so on and so forth. So this is a great lift from the single unit literature. And so what happens is, um, well, for start, a, a very specific and kind of a pleasant surprise. So even those of you who are non-neurophysiologists, you know, the most hardcore linguists can see uh, one of these is not like the other. Right? So there's a bump. What is that bump? I'll explain it to you in a minute. So you take the, um, f you take a channel, you know, we record from a bunch of channels at the same time. Each channel you treat in a particular way. So for instance, let's say you analyze the frequency domain, let's say a Fourier analysis, for instance, something very vanilla, nothing special. Here's the different frequencies, and then here's the, uh, for instance, the phase response and the power response in this comparison. So I don't want to go through this, obviously this is the wrong place to explain this in detail, but what you see is there's a bump. And so there's a bump, this is for one channel, or one channel across channels. This bump is in a special place. It's in the low frequency domain, this is called the theta band, I think you can't see that very well. So the theta band is very low frequency, it's like four to eight hertz. And the response in this theta band seems to identify which sentence you were. Not the power of the response, the phase of the response, that's the detailed timing. So at this point you should be very confused, except for probably Stan and Lena. Uh, wherever else is a neurophysiology person. Um, so what, what can this possibly, yeah, Susan? Uh, can I just ask you, you hear it by the same, you, the is it the same? Same token, actually, same it's token. Like it's the same token so that, that you hear. So, so you know, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it, well, it, it, better, it better be. I mean, it's sort of a proof of principle that, the, that your measurements work, right? Mm -hmm. So, w but what, you know, the question is why is it in this part? That, so the non-trivial part will be, why is it here and not elsewhere? So, um, so what, what does this mean for those of you who don't traffic in this kind of data? Well, the theta band is a particular frequency signature, which means it's associated with a certain time window, right? So the time window is, let's say, on ballpark 200 milliseconds. So what does this data mean if it's 200 milliseconds and all my response is in the phase domain and not the power domain? What it means is you have a window, and that window is sliding across your input or rather your input is sliding through your windows. And the phase of that window is reset as a function of the input. So you get some kind of phase pattern. So the interpretation of this is you, you're, the world is coming at you, you say chop, 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 roughly like that. So far so good? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, so um, well, can I, is there any in actually in interesting information in this phase pattern? Sure, I, that I can show. So I can say, let's take for instance, sentences that are perfectly intelligible, right? So you can, uh, your performance is 100%. So this is, and now I'm gonna take the phase pattern from one sentence and I wanna know, do all the others classify to be that sentence? So does one phase pattern for the sentences like whatever, three seconds long, uh, does it actually group with the same sentence? And it does, right? So the phase of the theta band is, you know, one is one, two is two, and two is three. So it's a very successful classifier. Things get better. So that's, that's just a proof of principle that your thing works, right? So now suppose, what I also did in this experiment is I played you a bunch of other sentences, namely those of which I know you can't understand it very well, because I manipulated them in very systematic ways, which I'm surprised that you did. So I can, and I can do that, you know, der lange Rede, kurzer Sinn. Uh, I can make that so I can calibrate your performance in particular ways. So now, suppose you don't understand it well. Suppose you understand it at a level of 80% instead of 100% then your response goes down commensurately and your classifier performance goes down. And if you get even worse, it gets even worse. 
So there's a systematic relationship between the phase of that response and intelligibility. Now it becomes a little bit more interesting. Right? So now it relates in a very principled way to what, what you actually extract as a perceptual organism. So, so far still so good? So this theta band response of this, rough, this roughly sized window is, is important. Now, um, you know, that, that's nice. Those are kind of weird sentences. You're lying in this machine and it's all very, uh, a lot of artifice, which you know, Mark rightly criticized. Um, what about having something a little bit more naturalistic? So we had, well, wh what does naturalistic mean on a college campus? If you take undergraduates and you play them a movie, like in this case, the movie Dumb and Dumber, which is a campus classic, and uh, you do the same experiment again. So now they're watching real scenes, right? So scenes, uh, you know, different clips of this movie. They're looking at these two characters doing all kinds of weird stuff, and we, you know, we create a complicated mix and match amount of stuff. Uh, now the question is, do you get it? Does it scale up to a more realistic scenario? And in particular, does the auditory system give you the same kind of response, and does the visual system give you the same kind of response? And luckily, it does. So we're all good. It's again, in, it's in phase and not in power. It's low frequency. So this sort of replicates and extends the original thing. So. Um, so far, so, so good. So what is, so now, where can we begin to sort of develop the linking hypothesis? Well, if this is on the right track, if there really is something like a perceptual window, which you need to sort of eat the perceptual world at its coming at you at a certain more or less fixed granularity of time, then does that remind us of anything that we know uh, from, let's say, linguistics? And the answer is obviously yes, otherwise it wouldn't be here. So let's first look at the physics of the stimulus one more time. Um, if you take spoken sentences, you can do this for any language you want, and you analyze the temporal structure of spoken language over, a bu incidentally, a bunch of naturalistic rates. I mean, even to about a factor of two compression, which you still understand perfectly, you can, do, uh, you can analyze the spectrum as where's the peak energy in the signal, and it turns out to be for, you know, acro across languages between four and eight hertz. So that's presumably no accident, right? So that's something about the physics of the signal. So what is that? Is there anything that reminds us of that? Well, there is, and it turns out to be across a whole range of old and recent studies, the mean duration of syllables cross-linguistically, whether you look at it as an acoustic phenomenon or as an articulatory one. As here's the old data from, from uh, John O'Hala actually recording himself <laughs> 10,000 times. So it's like the olden days, pre-MATLAB. There's no MATLAB, no you know, hardcore real research. Um, recording himself just reading and talking. So you get a very particular uh, oscillation cycle of jaw opening. Here's a group from Germany, the Institut für Phonetik in München, uh, doing it for a histogram of syllable duration for German, for tens of thousands of utterance. Here's work by uh, comparing Japanese and English by Steve Greenberg and Takayuki Arai from a few years ago. Here's a recent paper that got a lot of attention last year by Pellegrino and colleagues uh, comparing syllabic duration across a bunch of languages. It's completely consistent. Right? So, it's a, a, so there's something about the relationship between that across all languages, there's a sort of temporal primitive that you use both in articulation and in perception, and a property of brain mechanisms that are sort of optimally suited to bite that off. So we can go down a slightly different path and say, well, does the brain actually care about these sort of, is there something, a uh, special sensitivity to this such that we're tuned to it? And there is, and I'll give you one very quick example to use a different technique for, uh, for fun, fMRI. So you can play people, let's say, non-linguistic stimulus. So for instance, amplitude modulated sounds, really exciting. <laughs> That, you know, kind of stuff that you you want to come to my lab for, and um, we want to know is there. Let me get to the important one here. You want to know in the auditory cortex, is there a special sensitivity to rates of a particular scale, the ones that we know matter for speech? And it turns out again, you know, those of you not used to looking at this, this is you know a slice through the face of the brain like this, an axial slice. Uh, different colored regions are different cytoarchitectural regions of the brain, and here are the different activation patterns. Again, you can see one of these, there's always one sticking out, right? What's the one sticking out? Well, the one sticking out is the modulation frequency that's commensurate with what I've been talking about, namely 
three, four, or five hertz. Everything else has a significantly low, it's not just a low pass filter, it has a special sensitivity to that frequency. So that's kind of nice. So the brain, for reasons we are going to try to figure out, likes that particular rate of information transfer. Now, uh, so far, all these experiments are studies in which I put something in your head as I play speech, I play weird sounds. Is it actually there all the time? There's this intrinsic activation of this form. So a few years ago, um, my colleague Anne-Lise Giraud did a nice study when people are doing nothing. There's now, this is a combined EEG and fMRI study. So participants are lying. So this is the, you know, the really boring, this is a shopping list experiment. So you're lying. This is actually, for reasons I don't understand, Andreas Kleinschmidt, who didn't want to be uh, seen in this picture. So he's a very good looking man. So, uh, he has an EEG cap on. So while he has the EEG cap on, this you know, finessed equipment, uh, his, his MRI response is also recorded. So he's doing, what is he doing? He's doing nothing. So he's lying in the machine for 20 minutes, and we're recording the EEG continuously. And every now and then, we're acquiring the MRI whole brain volume. So you're doing nothing. Doing nothing means you're doing milk, sugar, dry cleaning, my wife hates me, that kind of thing. Uh, now, we take the EEG data from the entire session, and we filter it into the regions of interest, obviously. So in this case, the frequency or time regions of interest. So this is a theta band response and a gamma band response. I'm not going to talk about this. And you use that. You then convolve it with the hemodynamic response function. This is actually a, a, an example. Stan mentioned how this kind of approach this morning. And then you query where in the brain is the activation. And amazingly, you get very uh, specific activations. This, is, this experiment was done twice, thanks to reviewer number three, who we're also familiar with. <laughs> so reviewer number three <laughs> asked us to do the experiment once, one more time. Uh, so you get this sort of spatially specific distribution of activation for these particular ranges of, of uh, in this case, frequency ranges, but you know, sort of the brain breathing at a particular rate. So it's, you can see it's a little bit asymmetric. There's a strong correlation with the low modulation frequency in the right hemisphere, uh, the higher modulation frequency in the left hemisphere. That's consistent across a bunch of different experiments. Uh, and so you might ask yourself, is there any other place in the brain where this kind of thing lights up? I mean, everybody who's done brain imaging sees a picture like that and says, yeah, give me a break. You know, there's no way you get these two little spots and nothing else. You know, where else was the stuff? Well, uh, thanks to reviewer number three, we did a little bit more work. In fact, the other place where you get exactly the same intrinsic activation is the jaw and tongue area of the motor cortex, which is pretty nice because it means it's a sort of points to a mechanism to put the auditory and the articulatory system sort of into the same brain euros. As you want to coordinate the, the auditory information and the articulatory information on the right time scales, this points to a kind of pine-based mechanism to coordinate that, which is, which is pretty neat. So it seems, based on this kind of data, that the information is intrinsically there from brain's eye view. So that brings me back to um, where, so, you know, how, how we ended up with this kind of perspective. So the last experiment tells you, or that and you know, a gazillion other experiments tell you that there is, in fact, intrinsic neurophysiological activation at these rates. That is, the brain is the neuronal populations or you know, smaller groups of ensembles are breathing at rest at these rates. And uh, now, what are they doing once the information comes? So the stimulus on the top here comes in and elicits a continuous stream of spikes, action potentials, as it's coming up from the periphery. Now, they reset these input spikes. So I'm banging against the system. They reset the phase of these internal oscillations that are there all the time. So this is a way to actually generate sort of system states or sample the world in particular rates. And an extra quirk is that we know from other, re or we hope it's true from other research, that there's a nesting relationship between the lower and higher modulation frequency information. Now, spike trains turn out to be modulated by where they are in the phase of this other information. This is very elegant work. You know, Charlie Schroeder has work like that, Pascal Fries, and many others. So why does this matter? It, it's now a sort of soup to nuts way to go from the input waveform to, which starts with this continuous spike train of activation to discrete packages of information, which is now that's the stuff that needs to be decoded 
So this provides us a way to go from parsing the signal into units that we want to work with to decoding it into the more interesting and more challenging problems. That this is obviously a deep research problem. Is, you know, how is this represented such that we can now make contact with it? But this provides, let's say we, we might call it something like the um, sort of an auditory primal sketch or something like that, right? So it gives you intermediate levels of analysis. And actually, in fact, adopting, adapting and adopting, adopting and adapting the MAR type perspective more, it suggests that one way to begin to think about these linking hypotheses is at this sort of algorithmic level of representation, is um, uh, to begin to cash out how to do it. So now, like everyone today, I too have to say a few things about music. <laughs> right on. <laughs> but before I do that, let me give you one. So you might ask yourself, why, you know, I want to give you one quick fun evidence to do with, you know, we haven't had drinks yet and stuff. Is there an auditory? Is, there a, is this the thing that we can hear from? Maybe. Sounds like it. So you, sh you should ask yourself, well, look, I mean, some input waveform is coming at you all the time. You know, what, what's the sort of cool evidence that it is, in fact, chunked in some systematic way? So let me just give you fun, uh, one fun example, because, hey, we're here. So let's see if you can hear this. Okay, how, how'd you do? I'll buy you a beer right now. Okay, you didn't do so well? well how about this one? Ants carry the seeds, so better be sure that there are no ant hills nearby. Got that? Okay, it's pretty good. It's, worth, well, it's probably worth gin and tonic. We've all been rich and spoiled long enough to hate the machine age. You got that one? <laughs> okay, so, so here's the rub of these, right? Uh, all of these are played backwards. Uh, these are all stimuli that are played backwards. Uh, but the trick is this. They're played backwards at a particular scale. So if you take, this is a spectrogram of a forward sentence. Now, suppose I take an entire forward sentence and I flip it backwards. It goes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's very hard to understand. Here the trick is, uh, suppose I take slightly smaller chunks and reverse them. So it turns out, when you, this experiment has been done a number of times, uh, if you get the sweet spot here, your intelligibility is actually fine, even though, from the physics point of view, the signal is now going backwards locally. Right? So you take the original waveform, you slice it up and you flip it around, you flip it around, you flip it around. So Every local segment is, in fact, going backwards. But the global uh, arrangement is still going forward. So this has been done a number of times, and a very, it's a very kind of cool demonstration. Uh, the most prominent publication was uh, by Kuro Saberi in a Nature paper in 1999. So here's the segment duration that they took to reverse it. And the one point of interest here to show is basically, if you go up to 50 or 60 milliseconds, your performance is perfect. It's as if you, nothing had happened. But you're hearing the thing backwards. Right, so you should be like, no way. What was the, first one? the first one was 200 milliseconds. So that's the point. In fact, when you go to 100 to 200, which is roughly syllable <coughs> duration, it doesn't work anymore. So at the local scale, you can do interesting manipulations of the signal and maintain an intelligibility. But at the, glo at the global scale, if we define global as roughly syllable size, it doesn't work anymore. This has been done a number of, which one? We've all been rich and spoiled long enough to hate the machine age. Pretty good, right? <laughs> 50 that one's 50 milliseconds, yeah. So, I mean, this has been done. You can do this actually on your laptop for fun. If you have, uh, like, um, w what do you have? What's, what's freeware on, on a Mac? Prod. Pro a prod freeware. Yeah. So you can do this immediately in front. So you can do this, for instance, for, uh, you can do it for, uh, sentences that are semantically incoherent, as they were called here. So you really have to have bottom-up lexical information to get the performance right. And you know, up to about here, in the normal case, this is native versus non-native speakers, up to 50, 60 milliseconds. So it's very convincing and very easy to do. And so you know, something, something to think about when you're, you know, when you're bored one day. So but it's pretty compelling that it means you really do chunking in a form that means you seem to create a discrete representation of a size that's decoded and where the decoding operation doesn't actually care about the arrow of time in that particular zone. As it looks down at the thing and says, look, I have to do some you know, analysis of this. Who knows what it is? Hilbert or whatever. 
but I don't care about this. Okay, now, so do the these... Uh, well, they're not that unnatural, right? So, I mean, you're, if you reverse at a, at a rate of, a, of the syllabic scale, then you're completely lost. As that's the scale where within syllable order matters. Right. So at the phonemic or the, se let's say, segmental scale, you can reverse without cost. At the syllabic scale, you can't. Unless you do the same experiment in sign language, which I can show you in a second if you like. Well, if you do it there, you need actually the syllabic scale. So now, do these time scales matter at all for other, you know, so, I mean, coming to the music, I didn't just make this up. So let's, let's, do, let's see if it actually extends in a principled way to musical stimulus. So this is a recent experiment with a music uh, colleague of mine, Mary Farboot at NYU. And this experiment is very simple and very straightforward. She um, composed a whole, bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of eight note melodies. She's a, she's a music theorist at, in the music department at NYU. And um, we played them, we've done this experiment many times, this is a sort of one-off one description. You, uh, you listen to the sequence and you have to resolve, uh, you have to indicate if your musician was it resolved or not, for instance. So it's an example of tonal induction. So can you do this? Not a very difficult thing, it's something that everyone has to do if they listen to music. I mean, you, there's, it's an example of key finding, right? So you do this and now what, what Mary did in this experiment is uh, vary the rates over which you can do this and musicians and non-musicians and so on, uh, and then calculate it. So in this case, it's you know, D prime is a signal detection analysis, a per percent correct. And you, what you see is actually that there's a very particular plateau over which your performance is at ceiling and very good, remarkably good, but otherwise you fall pretty sharply down. That is, there's a rate of presentation over which tonal induction is perfectly good and a rate over which it falls apart. Now, at the fast rates, that's not surprising. At the fast rates, you can't resolve it anymore. Right? It's too, I mean, you can't individuate the, the items as they come, and you can't actually generate the representation. Interestingly, you also get worse at the slow rates. So that means you also need to have the right rate of integration. So you have to, if it's too slow to actually integrate into a unit that you can interpret, it doesn't work either. So that's pretty neat. That means over, the same, over this particular range, we found a particular performance for a musical task. Now, how does that relate to various tasks, other musical or speech tasks? Interestingly, it lines up very beautifully. For instance, so optimal tonal induction, as we called this, had a lower bound and an upper bound between 30 and 400 beats per minute. It's about 0.5 to 6.7 hertz. Now, it turns out to align perfectly with a bunch of experiments done by Warren many years ago for melody recognition, which is pretty closely related, right? So that doesn't make sense. But also beat induction, which is not so much related. It means that there's a sweet spot in the time domain for when you actually assign something, a kind of regularity. It turns out to be a little slower than speech, where the optimal rate for speech seems to be four to five hertz. Here, it seems to be about two hertz, so a, a little bit slower. But a whole bunch of things turn out to align in the time domain in terms of the, the dynamics of perceptual analysis. So I think presumably no accident, right? So, um, so to close, I think, I think I'm done anyway, right? So. Um, Zero minutes? Um, negative zero minutes? At least, I don't want to know. Four minutes on my thing. Um, so to, to go back to the levels thing. The, so so Jean-Pierre doesn't like the Mars eye view, but let me defend it anyway, um, since I have the floor for one more minute. The, it seems like, for negative one more minute, the, um, if we make this sort of, if we, if we uh, go through this exercise of uh, trying to identify, let's say, a rep representational cognome or a parts list for music or for language, this is what I started out with, is we can query you know, each other as colleagues and say, well, what are the primitives that we're not willing to live without? Maybe, the, I don't know, the notion of variable or variable binding or something like that, concatenation. I mean, the most elementary things that we're not willing to live without. Um, it seems like in this exercise, we come up with uh, lists or primitives for music and language that are quite different. But where the overlap seemed to lie, this is a long exercise we went through last summer, in fact, some of us here. <laughs> um, they seem to lie in the computational primitives. That is, the domain general set of operations that apply seem to come that at the algorithmic and representational characterization, 
not at the representational or computational level of analysis. So it's if we're looking for uh, alignments, similarities, and differences, they often appear in things like, you know, I don't know, you have to extract relative pitch discretized sequence or, you know, what have you. But the set of primitives that you're operating on seem to be different. So I think this is, you know, we don't have to like the view, but it's a useful way to organize the information in a way to ask the questions, I think, in a productive way, experimentally, and I think also theoretically. So, okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.